Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I am Kristen Helm, the Community Engagement Coordinator at Tucson Audubon, and I am honored to introduce my colleague, David Robinson, who is our conservation advocate. Um, he will be speaking today about birders in the ballot box, how we can turn out the environmental vote for birds and for our environment. Um, so without further ado, I will go ahead and turn over the floor to him. Welcome, David. Hey, thank you, Kristen. And um, I know there were some other people who signed up, maybe they'll join, maybe they won't, but it's a small group, so um, we can be less formal. Um, I am happy to take questions. If I need to save some until the end, I'll just say, hey, let, let's hold that, you know, till the end. I'd love just, we can do just quick introductions. I'll introduce myself in just a moment, but um, if you don't mind just, uh, you know, saying, well, the name you've heard be called by um, where you're tuning in from and uh, a very recent, well, just a recent uh, bird sighting that has excited you. So um, how about uh, Dan, would you start us off? Uh, hi, I'm uh, Dan Shire. I'm actually in Ontario, Canada, just east of Toronto. But my wife and I go down to Arizona in the winter and southeast Arizona. So uh, we've been stayed in Tucson. We've gone to um, the Patent Center and so on. And we're looking forward to travel again in a couple months down to Arizona. Um, I'm involved with uh, Ontario Nature, which is an organization in Ontario, which is an affiliation of 150 different nature clubs across the province, maybe 12,000 members, I guess, across the province and so on. And we we had a provincial election equivalent to a state election in June. We got a government that's anti-environment uh, there. And we're going into our municipal elections in about two weeks across the province as well. So um, um, I'm interested in, uh, you know, tips and experience of other organizations in terms of being able to manage the, elect the elections a little bit better. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, and uh, any particular bird sighting or bird encounter that has lifted your heart of late? Um, we were at our, our rural property and we saw a couple of uh, bald eagles fly over. So we have bald eagles that uh, winter in my area of Ontario. Um, and uh, those are probably the most majestic, majestic birds we're gonna see for the uh, our birding season, I think. That's terrific, great. Um, Ken, would you like to uh, introduce yourself? If you can hear us. Well, maybe not, we'll see um, Dave. Dave DeGroot, uh, active in uh, trying to uh, support conservation efforts in a place called the Tortolita Preserve. Uh, in the town of Morana, which just had a municipal election. And the election was a perfect example of pro-development versus sustainability. Mm -hmm. This was about three weeks ago. And the sustainability people were vastly underfunded compared to the opponents, but they, had, they lost, but it was a pretty good showing. Mm -hmm. And they actually took some heart in that um, they were within a couple of their group was within a couple of percentage points of the the uh, pro development people who had vastly more money on the table. So anyway, and that's why I'm here, David. I'm uh, hoping to pick up some tips and uh, being active at the ballot boxes now at this stage in my life becoming really important to me. Great. And uh, any bird encounter that's oh yeah um, I'm not a I'm a kind of a generalist but I saw the birds that interested me out there just a couple of days ago three Harris's hawks together which is not too unusual I assume they're a hunting team but then they also had two additional smaller hawks uh, at first glance I thought they were uh, red tails. But now I'm thinking maybe juveniles. Mm. Uh, I don't know. Uh, but the five of them worked as a, were a unit. And uh, I, as I 
I'm sorry to go on and on, but I trained my camera on the telephone pole where the five of them were sitting. And as soon as they saw the camera, they all moved to the next telephone pole. All five took some pictures there and moved again to the next telephone pole, but they were a unit, all five of them. I, I bet I bet they're a family. Um, mm -hmm. But you can always, you can always, if you've got any pictures, you can send them to us and we'll have our our best bird identification folks okay. take a look. Okay, thank always, you. Always a thrill. That's and, so cool. Five hair socks. That's fantastic. <laughs> Ken, um, are you there? Okay. Kristen, any uh, bird encounter recently that uh, has brought you joy? You know, I've been um, pretty homebound recently. I just got over COVID and, you know, have been kind of, it's taken a while to get get back on my feet, but I've really been enjoying since the weather's been nicer, sitting out in my back patio and appreciating my backyard birds. We have a, a Costas hummingbird that's a resident here and he chases off all the other ones. We call him Lucifer, even though he's not a Lucifer hummingbird, but he is kind of a little bit of a pain in the butt. So <laughs> that's what we call him. Um, and it's just been fun getting to sit out there with him again. So yeah. Um, I'll do mine in reverse order. Um, a recent bird joy experience. Uh, on Saturday, I, I drove to the Aravaca uh, Cienega birding area, sort of, I think it's really kind of southwest of Tucson, about an hour and 15 minutes or so, and walked around a lot, saw cool stuff. And then on the way back, um, in between thunderstorms, I saw a hawk up in a tree and at first I passed by, I'm like, oh, I have to get where I'm going. I'm like, what are you doing, David? It's there. So I turned around, pulled over to the side, crept closer, and another one came in. And I thought they were two different species because one was very light, one very dark. Make a long story short. I mean, they posed for quite a while. It was a light morph and dark morph Swainson's hawk, pair of Swainson hawks. Um, and they, yeah, I was able to for a long, I don't think I got any good pictures, but got pictures so that oh was, that's so cool it was very cool um i'm in just a moment i'll share my screen and i'll show you you know kind of tell you what we have to ex uh what, what to expect in the next whatever 50 minutes and it, it includes a spot for me to tell you just a little bit more about myself so you know where i'm coming from on this so i am going to share my screen see if this works and now if i put it in play mode hopefully this will oh that's good enough what to expect so can you see kristen the yep great okay looks good. so here here's what's coming up a bit about me a little bit why elections matter and i think you folks already get it talk a little bit about this this challenge of maintaining <laughs> Staying on the side of nonpartisan uh, versus nonpolitical, which is something that as a 501c3 nonprofit organization, Tucson Audubon has to do. A little bit about environmentalists and voting. Environmental Voter Project, that was our partner in uh, a lot of the stuff we're doing. Um, and then some practical things on working with them to get out the environmental vote and also having fun. But I'll work in some stuff that applies in a number of ways. So um, I can't remember if I on this one have any notes. So let's see. Yeah, um, so I cut my teeth on, on AIDS activism back in the late 80s and early 90s with ACT UP New York. You know, I'm, I'm gay. I moved to New York City right after college in 1986. And uh, gay men were, were sickening, you know, getting sick and dying um, in huge numbers all around me. And um, I had been looking for gay liberation activism and what I found was AIDS activism, which turned out to be also gay liberation, fighting for my life and the life of people I loved and fighting for what everyone deserves, right? Um, healthcare and uh, just dignity and not to be persecuted was fighting for liberation. So that's where I got my start. And then over the years, I've been back and forth between teaching 
um, and being in nonprofit work. And my nonprofit work has um, included affordable housing, um, equitable urban planning, anti-displacement work that was in LA, also um, LGBT inclusion in Jewish life in the Bay Area, and now uh, merging my love of birds with uh, my activist tendencies, conservation director or director of conservation advocacy here at Tucson Audubon. I've been a birder since about age 10. My dad got a bird feeder, put it up, and I was immediately hooked. But I hadn't, I wasn't one of those like wunderkind birders who like quickly knew everything. It's just like, I didn't even know <laughs> how to find other birders. So I usually went on my own and I had my little field guide and whatever. And then I do more birding or less birding over the years. But uh, over the past, I'd say 15 years, birding has become more and more the center of my life and definitely my greatest joy. Um, I took a master birding course in the Bay Area. I learned how to bird by ear. It changed my life, love it. Um, so birding is, and now even more, just kind of any kind of nature watching is really what, what grounds me and brings me the most joy. And uh, during the 2020 elections, uh, I was on the board of Golden Gate Audubon and was at a meeting of our conservation action committee where, the, and this was, must have been about March of 2020. And um, there was a discussion of a lot of local projects that the organization had been following for a while. Usually most were development projects that could be really damaging to a particular area. And they all mattered, but there was no discussion of the upcoming election. And after the meeting, I, I talked with the chair and said, you know, is the committee gonna address this? And, and she said, I've been wondering the same thing. They're really not into it, but both of us felt like the most important thing we could do for birds at that moment was to try to do something to affect the outcome of the 2020 elections because the policies that would result would be night and day, depending on who was in office. So we ended up um, doing some research and figuring out since we were in the Bay Area, we were not a swing state area, but we figured out that if we got birders together to phone bank to swing states, we could have more of an effect. Rather than just telling friends, make sure you get out and vote, that's not really the most strategic thing to do if you're not in a swing state. So that's the very first thing I recommend is you have to figure out where you are right then and there. Is that where more votes will have a significant impact? Are there important competitive races? Now, if you're looking at a municipal election that will have effects on your area, yes, right, that matters. If you're starting to think provincially, your city depends on what the voting rules are or statewide, it depends on what you know, voting rules are. Here in Arizona, yes, turning out you know, voters for governor, for secretary of state, for corporation commission, those all matter. And no matter where you are in the state, your vote counts. But only certain legislative districts for our state legislature are um, competitive. So if you're not in one of those competitive districts, the first thing I recommend, or the second thing, once you've determined, oh, is this a place to try to get more votes? Or do I need to look elsewhere? Well, then lots of places you can go online, um, I can't recommend any of the partisan ones, but I'm sure you can you know, figure out quickly where you could go to find out what races are competitive, what matter the most. And you start exploring how to turn out voters there. So like I have a, still a close friend from the Bay Area who's gonna be flying out here at the end of the month for a week's worth of canvassing here in um, Arizona because she'll have a much bigger effect by knocking on doors here than she would by knocking on doors in the Bay Area. You can also, a good thing about phone banking is you can be anywhere, absolutely anywhere, and as calling to a particular swing state. So the group that, again, I, I recommend, they're nonpartisan, and I'll talk about them later, Environmental Voter Project. They do nonpartisan phone banks to different swing states where they're reaching out to people they know to be environmentalists. And I'll tell you more about that. So that's the basic thing is be strategic with your efforts. 
Um, another one is if you're talking about donating, um, I follow a couple of groups that research. Hello and welcome to Iris. Um, I, I follow a couple of groups that research where political donations can have the most impact. So simply giving to, because you see an ad about a, or you receive an email about a particular candidate, just giving to them, I mean, it's better than nothing, but you have no idea whether their campaign is actually well-funded or not, whether they're spending their money wisely or not. So if you turn to groups that um, look for what are the most competitive races, where is the margin smallest, which operations are most effective and which ones aren't receiving funding. That kind of research really helps. Um, the two that I follow are partisan. So again, I can't talk about them here. If, if we were to run, each other, run into each other birding or something, I might be able to recommend something, but a little bit of research that way, Googling, checking, or even calling up um, organizations you respect. Um, who have some political involvement, you know, electoral involvement, and asking, hey, um, do you know any groups who have been really researching where dollars matter the most right at this point in the election cycle? Um, even if you're not doing that, you just want to raise for a particular party or group, think about ways you can multiply your effect. So if you're going to give, how about reaching out to a friend and saying, okay, look, Let's make a pact. We're both giving. We're going to make a donation every week between now and the election or every day or have a house party. And people do these in person. They do them out back in their garden. They do them online. Getting together with someone I know is his birthday is coming up in a week and he's doing uh, an online Zoom birthday party. He's sent out invitations. He's told us which group um, they're raising money for it's election focused and um you know i think his tagline was um give me the best gift in the world for my birthday democracy right so anything you can do to take an individual action to a collective action immediately magnifies your impact it also i'll tell you emotionally spiritually it's more sustaining there's no, I find no better antidote, antidote to despair, pessimism, or inertia than doing something with other people. So, okay. So um, why elections matter for birds? I think if you're here, you probably already have some ideas. In fact, why don't I ask? <laughs> um, anyone feel free to unmute. Um, any thoughts about why elections matter for birds? Um, yes. Yeah, I can give you an example. Whoops, yeah. I don't know if it froze or not. Um, uh, where I live is, whoops. Looks like I cracked. Yeah, we your picture froze. Yeah, I'm just restarting Zoom. Okay. Great. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Maybe you, can, you might be able to hear me. We can. Okay. I could jump in a minute while Dan is. Yeah, Dave, why don't you, why don't you say something? Just very briefly, um, in the recent Marana election, uh, or three years ago, the pro development people for this 2,000 acres that I'm trying to help protect, the pro development people uh, came up with a huge rezoning plan, which would have torn the heart out of the uh, reserved land, would have put uh, all the reserve spaces along washes with developments and homes and roads and everything between the washes. Mm -hmm. uh, that so that's my little story uh, about how Perfect. the election. Perfect example, local in the US, municipalities have control over zone, what can be built where, and that has enormous impact on birds and their habitats. So yeah, that's one very clear one. Dan? Yeah, the, I put a link in the uh, chat. Um, 
about a year and a half ago, uh, the local municipality, which is a city of 100,000, they wanted to turn a wetland into industrial land. And it, we found out eventually it was, they wanted Amazon to build a big distribution center. But this was a provincially significant wetland um, that was supposed to be protected. Politicians in our city are pro-development. So our election is on right now. I was talking to a candidate last week who came to the door and she had been active in the fight against this uh, development. Um, once Amazon was identified as the candidate to be the uh, on the property, they backed right off because they didn't want the bad press. The politicians yeah. were gonna keep pushing, but the, the candidate uh, business said, okay, we're done. And they walked away. So we won that one, protected the wetland. Um, that was a, a group of young people in university that organized a whole bunch of things there. But it's, this is the first time in 30 years that I've lived in my city where candidates have come at the door talking about the environment. That's great too, exactly. Um, and, you know, well, so Tucson Audubon's most recent issue, we have a quarterly magazine we put out called the Vermilion Flycatcher. And I don't know if you can see, Vote Birds is the featured cover story. We actually did a section on the connection between electoral politics, birds, the environment, and climate. This is something the organization hasn't done. Um, and most environmental organizations who are nonprofits that I encounter avoid electoral politics. Um, and if you, I don't know if you've ever been out birding or with people and sort of encountered if something political has come up, people saying things like this, you know, I didn't get into birding to talk about politics and, oh, let's not talk about politics, it's divisive, or can't we just enjoy the birds, you know? And as someone who turns to birds and nature for, my gosh, solace and re-energization and, and just, you know, a lot of things that keep me going, I get this. I get not wanting to talk about these things. But not seeing the connection between politics and specifically electoral politics and the fate of these creatures that we love and their habitats that to me is willful ignorance, um, you know, and, and at some point I feel I can't share that joy with people who are essentially just taking and then standing idly by while something is destroyed or worse, contributing to with their votes or their money or their participation, contributing to the destruction of these things. And a little example I kind of sometimes give is, you know, if you were out birding with somebody who like point out a bird, oh, or you look, wow, that's gorgeous. And okay, you guys, you, you finished great. They took out their gun and they shot it dead, right? Or, you know, every time you pass a lovely habitat, they're like, are you guys done yet? Okay, great. And they set fire to it. You would stop them, right? I mean, that would be um, insane. You'd have no qualms about making the connection. You're destroying what we love. This makes no sense. Don't do it. If they belong to an organization, say one of the ones that wants to, is campaigning to, to clear that wetlands out and put in a factory, right? And they're just standing idly by or even taking part in some way in supporting the work of that group. Aren't they complicit in destroying, helping to destroy, the very least putting in peril the things that supposedly you both love? And so, you know, I mentioned at the uh, very beginning that I got my start in AIDS activism. You know, I had to learn early on to have some very difficult conversations, not just about sexuality and sexual practice and how to keep each other safe, but conversations with people um, I knew, including sometimes family members, about what they were doing or not doing and in terms of their votes uh, and how it was affecting my life and literally the survival of people I loved. And um, you know, this was back when in 1986, the Supreme Court upheld, the US Supreme Court upheld the right of states in the United States to criminalize same-sex sexuality. It was a case called Bowers versus Hardwick. And I remember having a very uh, tense but ultimately productive conversation with my father about 
are very different. You know, I was living in a country that said the states could make my way of making love, could say that was a crime and could arrest me for it. Um, and if he couldn't see that in any way, voting for or supporting people who supported that view was, was harming me, how could he say he loved me? Well, he didn't in fact vote for people like that, but he played devil's advocate for a while, trying to separate politics. And by the end, I was able to say, you know, like these things are not separate. Our actions, our votes are actions, right? Or our refusal to vote. Our opting out of voting is still an action and has consequences. So I feel that we as environmentalists, we as bird lovers, nature lovers, have to be more assertive about this now. Be willing to, to, to create an uncomfortable conversation if the response you're getting is some kind of resistance. You don't have to be aggressive or mean, right? But to really stop and be willing to take, tolerate the um, tension uh, to try to see if you can reach a point with someone where they get that, oh, this stuff is in peril. Yeah, I guess I guess I need to align myself and take actions that will help save them, right? Um, in terms of social justice, sometimes people don't see the connection, but if I say black birders we, um, have any of you heard of that over the past couple of years, right? It's been this really amazing thing where black birders and nature lovers, biologists and others have, I think we're into year three, I think, spreading visibility of black people in nature, not just birding, but often birding. This, it's an image of black joy, black engagement with nature, and it has political, explicit political um, implications. Um, and it's certainly for a lot of us birders, the connection between sort of diversity and acceptance and inclusion makes sense. So something like the Feminist Bird Club, which really promotes the inclusion of everyone in birding, everyone should be welcome, or birdability, which particularly focuses on, on birders with physical or other disabilities and making birding inclusive for them as well. That makes sense. And we can see that social justice, most people get that. But if you then bring up environmental justice, that already, that term, I don't know if anyone, you don't have to respond, but if anyone has a thought about what, what that term means to them, um, I don't know if you've heard it or not. It's tended, oh yeah, Iris. Is that mean, um you know, our environment, our, our conservation of our environment, um, our surroundings, our neighborhoods, our, is a climate change involved and? Yeah, all of that. Okay. And this is one of the big things for, for birders who have the um, economic security that affords you know, them enough to live in a neighborhood that is vegetated, right? Mm -hmm. that that has clean air, that has clean water, that probably has some trees and birds going through it. And can even, if you have enough, you know, you can afford gas and a car, and maybe you can even afford plane tickets, and you can go to places to go see birds. Your vision of what in being environment of the environment is often about that out there. It's about those parks, those other lands. Environmental justice is a movement that's been around in various forms for decades, but especially in the, the 70s came to the fore, um, pointing out that, well, this is past the 70s, but highways, highways got put through in the US almost always through poor, usually black or brown neighborhoods. They got sighted right there and the environmental impacts have been massive, just to give one, asthma levels from the smog are you know much much higher near freeways than elsewhere sighting of uh trash dumps of incinerators of a whole variety of polluting industries have almost you know they're far more of them are in poor and or um, black or brown neighborhoods uh polluting mines often get permitted um, on uh, near or sometimes even on indigenous land, poisoning the waters there, poisoning the air. So that 
if you are on the wrong side of that, if you're on the impact side, for you, the environment includes your immediate surroundings and simply fighting to protect the Tongass National you know, Forest in Alaska, which is very important, right? That makes sense. But only protecting far away if you live in a really polluted you know, city, a part of a city in Pittsburgh or Detroit, or you know, maybe a part of, um, uh, you know, um, in Ontario, a part of, which, what's one of the biggest cities that would be, uh, revealing my Canadian ignorance, but anywhere, if you're in a place where you don't enjoy those benefits of clean air, clean water, clean land, and access right there around you to nature, to green space, to parks, then the environmental movement often doesn't seem to address your needs. So bringing in environmental justice is the challenge that many, many organizations and conservation and, and environmental organizations are facing and are trying. And um, Iris brought up climate and a term that also gets used is climate justice. You know, it's just, we talk about it here in, in, uh, in Arizona, especially in Tucson, the heat island effect. You know, the, the places with the least tree cover, often the most concrete or the most um, blacktop, they're much hotter than other places. And it tends to be that the poorer the neighborhood, the less vegetation, the higher the temperature, um, the greater the effects of climate change. So um, that's just one example. So bringing in environmental justice and climate justice really matters. And finally, economic justice seems to be the biggest stretch for people. And I agree that we're not all gonna agree on every point, but you know, if you don't have enough money to afford you know, a decent uh, apartment, if you don't have enough money for food, right, for healthcare, it's a lot to be asked to fight for animals and trees, right? If you're just li literally trying to you know, survive. And again, all groups will not agree on all points and all affected groups within them, themselves, communities don't all agree. No one's, mon no community is monolithic, but more and more trying to recognize that we can't just be in a sense, single issue. You know, I can't just ask, is a certain politician good for the birds or bad for the birds, right? I do ask that to myself. <laughs> that may be one of the first things I ask, but then looking and seeing, because if someone's good for the birds and bad for a whole lot of people, hmm, maybe that's not gonna be the solution. And I bring this up as a practical matter because you'll find if you're trying to get people involved, the more you try to reach beyond people who are really exactly like you, the more you find you're going to have to have more a more nuanced and complex approach to politics than simply, you know, a very single good for the birds bad. Um, just I'll go really quickly through this so we get back to some really practical things. But here in the US, one prime example of elections directly, you know, the, the outcome of elections directly affecting birds is the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. It's one of the, one of the if not the first um, pieces of conservation legislation in the US um, for birds, to protect birds. And it was passed in 1918. And between 1918 and I think 1971, certainly till the early 70s, it just applied to individual human beings killing protected birds. Originally it was strictly migratory birds. And then the, the, the categories of birds that were included grew and grew. Um, but it is illegal, like to just go out and kill um, most, most songbirds here, most hawks, most others, that's illegal in the US um, without a permit for a particular reason. But in the seventies, I think again, 71, it was expand, expanded to uh, also cover actions by industry, by companies, by organizations, especially industry, not intentional killing, that would have been covered, but incidental um, killing, uh, they call it take, but incidental killing of these protected birds. And it would be if the, if the, opera, the way you're operating, say your industry, if you 
no, have a, if it would be reasonable to um, extrapolate from your operating practices that it's going to kill a whole bunch of birds, maybe you're leaving open pits. Um, I think that they're like these open oil pits around the country in some places, birds end up drowning in them, getting stuck. Um, if you're releasing um, a tremendous amount of, uh, of pollution in one particular area where birds would be, right? It's, a, it's illegal. Even though the intention your company had was not, you were trying to build widgets, not kill birds, but the way you're building the widgets is killing birds, that's illegal. Under President Trump, uh, well, President Trump attempted to roll that back. And his administration issued regulations to get rid of that, that part of the law so that companies, if, they, if this was unintentional killing of the birds, it's just a byproduct of their operations, it wouldn't be illegal. And he set those rule changes in motion. And then when President Biden was elected, he set in motion reversing that reversal to bring it back to it. And that was a very direct connection and um, many, many groups, especially the bird focus groups in the US, did a lot of work, they put out you know, a lot of pressure to try to first fight those rule changes and then to make sure that the next administration, the Biden administration overturned them. Simple, very direct. David, I was just gonna interrupt for a second. That, that yeah. migratory bird treaty is really important in Canada too, because we have a joint treaty with, with the US and your birds come north in the winter to breed and then they go south uh, to the States and, and to South America. So the, the work that those conservationists did a hundred years ago in Canada and the US is so important for you know the progress that was made. So it was dis disturbing to watch how some of those things were starting to be unwound for a while. And, and we're glad that uh, we've got a lot of work to do on our side of the border too, but we were glad to see that yeah. um, those positive policies were able to be reintroduced. Yeah, and that's a great reminder that, of course, right, birds and other wildlife are not bound by um, most, you know, political, national, you know, borders. And, uh, so what happens in one country very often has a huge effect on others. Um, these were just National Audubon put out a lot. Um, and National Audubon is very careful to be nonpartisan, but they kept putting out the facts on this and really pushing hard. Another example is climate change. And I'll just give the, the sort of biggest, simplest example of how elections can change, uh, affect um, climate change policy. Right. And first, I think everyone knows that climate change is already having a huge impact on birds. And the worse, the, high, the, the more severe the global warming, the larger the effect. If you've not seen this study by Audubon, I highly recommend it. National Audubon Survival by Degrees. Um, it's also pretty amazing graphics, um, but it's really very powerful. Um, the Paris Climate Agreement. Um, Right. In 2015, right, as they were being, uh, after they've been created, President Obama signed the US onto the agreements. President Trump immediately upon being elected announced his intention to withdraw the US from the treaty. treaty and near the end of his, his term, he in fact followed through on that. Uh, it, there was a lot of complication in terms, almost like paperwork, right? You couldn't just do it with words. So it took a few years, but he did it. And then on President Biden's first day in office, he issued an executive order starting a process for having the US rejoin. You can't get more direct than that with, you know, sort of elections, the outcome of elections affecting climate change policy. But the impact of elections goes so far beyond that. And I, there's a piece in this, in our issue of the Vermillion Flycatcher, where um, we try to lay out just how extensive the connections between uh, electoral outcomes and the environment are. And if you remember that, certainly here in the US, elected officials very often have the power to appoint many people. So if you, if you take if you add up the number of elected officials who have an influence on 
decision-making power on uh, electoral focused issues, I mean, environmental focused or climate focused issues, and then add in all the appointees of different departments and it's staggering. Um, so again, our, our vote sitting it out and saying, well, I made political, you know, I, I don't, I did once during the 2020 election, meet someone online who, you know, their Instagram account had gorgeous, gorgeous bird photos. And I sent a little message saying, yeah, these are extraordinary, it's amazing. And then for this project that we did trying to get birders to phone bank to swing states, we needed some bird visuals for the website we created. And I reached out and asked if we could use any of his and his response, well, I made political, I don't. And we had a very tense and unproductive discussion. Um, and I wish back then I had this, I could have said, read this first and then we'll talk, right? Um, so yeah, uh, the connections between elections, almost any environmental uh, or climate issue and many, many bird folks ones is affected in some way by someone who was elected or was appointed by someone elected. Which brings us to this, I mentioned earlier, this kind of sticky question of nonpartisan versus non-political. And we usually say apolitical, but this worked better for the visuals and alliteration. Um, in the US, our tax law um, prohibits what are called 501c3 tax exempt organizations, and Tucson Audubon is one, from right indirectly participating in or intervening in any political campaign on behalf of a particular candidate or opposed to a candidate or a party. And then it tells us that, oh, there are certain ones, if you do them in a nonpartisan manner, you're not advocating for or against a certain candidate or a certain party, you're doing this more to educate the public or strictly on the voting process, registering people, helping them, making sure they know where and how to vote. That, that latter part is allowed, that is allowed. But it turns out things get sticky on the stuff where you're addressing, like you could hold a political forum, and invite, have candidates from a variety of parties and they, you don't recommend any of them, they present their views and then the audience or whoever asks questions and they can, that's okay. But things get sticky when you get closer to elections and the facts that you present might lead a reasonable person to go one way or the other. And groups, most larger organizations or groups who can employ uh, a lawyer on this get advised by their lawyers to therefore just avoid this entirely. Like what I told you earlier about just the facts about the climate agreement, us being signed on and signed and you know signed off and signed on, that that I am being partisan. There are some lawyers who would say that, yeah, you could, you're imperiling your 501c3 status. Others say, no, we have to push back against this because if you can't state the actual facts, then basically you're allowing political actors to evade responsibility for their actions and their positions, right? So Tucson Audubon is one of a number of organizations has, that has decided, okay, we are going to go so far as to state facts about things that have happened, especially to emphasize that it's important that you vote, that you become an educated voter in terms of especially birds and the environment and that you vote. Um, in terms of your own particular reaching out to people, I think the thing that matters most as a private citizen, you know, you can be as partisan or nonpartisan as you want. And I think it's important to figure out what you're most comfortable with. If you are naturally, you find yourself uh, making arguments in favor of particular candidates or particular parties and their platforms and go with it. No reason to, to hold yourself back and only volunteer with say a nonpartisan group. On the other hand, 
if you find that it suits you more, you feel like you can reach people better through nonpartisan work, do that. They're both necessary and it's just important to find what you're most comfortable with. Now, sometimes people say, well, you know, reaching out to environmentalists about voting, you're, you, aren't you preaching the choir? Of course, environmentalists vote. We all care so much about the you know, environment. Huh? We're all passionate and dedicated. Turns out, no, not true. So Environmental Voter Project has done extensive research on it. And this, this number just shocks me in the US that in the 2020 presidential elections, right, over 8 million environmentalists didn't vote. And in the 2018 midterms, over 12 million. And they, they identified environmentalists through a lot, using a lot of sophisticated data. These were people who cared through, through sort of working with a lot of data, they found that these people care very much. They would rank as like one of the top two priorities for them, the environment or climate. And to find out that literally millions of people who seem to care so much about the environment or climate don't vote means that it's staggering and upsetting, but on the other hand, it means we have an opportunity. Because if we care deeply about birds, the environment, nature, you know, climate, reaching out to other people who do and helping them see the importance of voting and helping them to vote means we can have a real impact. Of course, they have to be, the, the, the caveat is what I said early on, you need to be reaching out to people who are in places where their vote is you know, gonna have effect because it's somehow a contested election of swing this. Um, oh. Strangely, Wait, I find that those numbers shocking too. I'm like, yeah, flabbergasted. Yeah, I was. The first time I found out about this, I really was. Let me see. I'm not in an endless loop. Okay, good. Environmental Voter Project or EVP. So I love this self definition here that they identify inactive environmentalists and transform them into consistent voters to build the power of the environmental movement. That is their mission. They are not, they don't um, only work in one particular election year because it's an intense one and sit it out the next. They have been doing this consistently for years and they, they do have a long-term goal of really building the power of the environmental movement. They are entirely nonpartisan. And the first thing they do here, this quote kind of says it, Right. Leveraging data analytics and predictive modeling, we identify millions of registered to vote environmentalists by name and street address. Then we use public voter files to narrow our focus to only those environmentalists who typically don't vote and are thus ignored by most political campaigns. And that last part is important to know that most political campaigns do a lot of research because public in the US at least, the records of who voted, not how you vote, not who you voted for, but whether you voted or not is public record. And so political campaigns direct their, uh, most of their efforts at people who are quote unquote likely voters whose records show that they actually turn up and vote. EVP says, ah, oh, there's a whole pool of people who are just left out of this, who are typically not voting, and if we can reach that, and they care deeply about the environment and climate, if we can reach them and get them to vote, we actually could have quite a sizable impact on um, the electoral outcomes. So then they do mobilization. And then, this is the one that I had the hardest time with when I was doing that project off the vote. I am a very issues oriented person. My, my impulse on an issue is to sit down with someone and talk through, okay, you see it that way, I see it this, let's talk about those issues and let's get some facts and let's, you know. They actually have done a lot of research and their founder, Nathaniel Stinnett, there, who's also still runs it, has a behavioral science background. And he's done a lot of research into what type of messaging works best to, to increase voter turnout. And this, <laughs> the most, depressing and daunting thing to me to hear was that issues focused ones don't. Um, also negative ones that say, oh my gosh, you know, 
bird lovers aren't turning up to vote. We have to get out there or else we're going to lose everything. Nope. That, that can even depress voter turnout. It tends to be things like get someone to, to sign a pledge or make a pledge earlier on that they are going to vote and then check back with them later. And the fact that most people don't want to feel like they are liars <laughs> aren't good for their word, it actually ups the number of people who, I used to think those pledges were useless and ridiculous. Why are you asking me to sign this pledge? This is stupid. And then to find out the science, the behavioral science behind it, it actually has a measurable positive impact on voter turnout. Another one is a message that goes more like, hey, you know, voter, um, whatever your party is, you, you we'll, we'll say bird lovers again. Bird lovers in your district, our research shows, have been turning out in huge flocks to vote. You don't want to miss out. You want to be part of the flock and get that increases voter turnout, that sense of positive being part of something, not being left out of it works uh, a lot more than the, oh my God, no one is turning out. And if, so you have to, you know. Another one is that uh, accountability, encouragement with pe from people you know. So a friend saying it, reaching out to a friend with a text works a lot better than an, an, an organization they don't know having done. It. Um, so your power as somebody, if you set, sit down, and I recommend this very highly as a practical tool, sit down and think of everyone you know and have some kind of positive relationship with. They don't have to be just close friends or close family. They can be colleagues, they can be neighbors, they can be you know, people if you have kids in school or, or whatever it is, right? Or other birders, think about them and then think about approaching them as, hey, do you, you know what? I got involved in something really cool. I care, I know you care so much about X. Any chance I could, you know, take you out for some coffee and talk with you about this? Or I, I got a friend to participate in something online recently, electoral focused by saying, hey, listen, if you attend this thing with me afterwards, we can then watch a movie, you know, over Zoom together or whatever. Zoom board. And, and that was enough. It was great because we're good friends. And she's like, okay, that's it. It's a deal. Right. Thinking about these ways to, to leverage your personal connection. Um, and leverage sounds manipulative and it really, in a way, it is. We're trying to have an effect on people, but it's also genuine. Right. Um, your personal connection with someone. And if you're looking to get people to donate to a particular cause, or in this case, the elections, Connect with what really matters to them. You know, my, my mom has tended to, she watches a lot of news that, that upsets her, but she doesn't think to, on her own, to, to donate. And yet she will give, a, a grandchild asks for something, boom, that's it, <laughs> great, you know? You need that, great, I'll buy, whatever. Your birthday's coming, great, you know? So I had a talk with her about, isn't the best gift you can give them, right? <laughs> Uh, a future with democracy and hopefully where climate change has not destroyed all these beautiful things. And, and it was, it's that kind of thing that um, connecting on values with people um, can really help motivate them. Last few things, I know we're almost done. Uh, you, EVP is just go to environmentalvoter.org. One word, environmentalvoter.org, and you can see what they do. They do texting. I put the link in the chat to there. Oh, thank you. We have done phone banking with them. We've also done canvassing. And so, uh, which is knocking on doors, right? And talk to people, or sometimes not when we leave some photo of literature. I used to be a literature professor, so I always laugh when people call. It's like, oh yeah, I'm gonna leave a copy of Anna Karenina in their door. But, you, know. you can, one very important thing right now in the US to do, totally nonpartisan, to volunteer to be a poll watcher which is about helping people. And sometimes it's in person, some it's, it's uh, staffing a phone line. You answer questions about the voting process. You help clear up confusion. You also can counter disinformation and there is intentional disinformation being spread. There was in the last election, there is in this one about who can vote, how they can vote, when they can vote. So um, that's a really great way to, to help. 
we have been, well, Octavote, I told you about getting burgers. We would do these Zoom events and I'd get a special Bird World star, um, you know, to, at the start. And we'd do a little interview and then we'd all phone bank and then we'd come back and have Q&A. But with Tucson Audubon, this Saturday, we're having our third birding and canvassing event. So we start out, we're birding for two hours, like 6.30 to 8.30 in the morning in a park that is near where Environmental Voter Project has some neighborhoods that door knocking. And so I have to plug in my computer. And so after we do our birding, we then have a little canvassing training. And then we go out and do some canvassing, some door knocking for a couple of hours in those neighborhoods. Um, and it's a great way to combine the thing we love, the birding, with then the action to help protect them. So I encourage you whenever, if you're trying to get people involved in whatever way, find something fun to include in it. The less something is purely a chore or a duty, the more that it has some fun, um, the more people will want to participate. And, um, you know, I can't blame them, right? Bring, bring more joy, fun, silliness even um, to whatever you're doing, whether it's phone banking, door knocking, a house party, um, or even just, you know, encouraging people to make sure they, they're registered and they get to the polls. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing this screen. And when we have last few minutes, are there any, are there any other sort of questions or comments or, or ideas? Because those are always welcome too. I had a question for you about the demographics of the people that are helping you accomplish these things. So I, I got gray hair. I'm a senior citizen now. And in my local city where we stopped that Amazon warehouse, it was kids in first year university. And there seems to be two populations that are, are passionate about this is people who have kids or grandkids are really worried about the future. And there's yeah. kids who really worry about their future. But in the middle, everybody seems so busy, I think. I don't know. Um, it, we really have problems mobilizing people in their 30s and 40s and maybe even in their 50s. And is that common in your experience as well? Uh, yes and no. Yes, certainly I find it in the, the birding and environmental communities. The ones that have been specifically birding and environmental for a long time skew um, older. Uh, skew wider, skew mm -hmm. um, more economically comfortable or, you know, affluent. Um, but there's a misconception, but it's a stereotype that, sorry, it's like, um, that um, people of color and poor people care less about the environment. And actually the opposite is true. All of the polling that's been done has actually shown consistently that um, it's people of color. And again, I'm talking the US, it has my base of knowledge, people of color um, and people of lower economic means actually rated higher, but they include the concept of environmental justice as part of the environment. Um, so there is a lot more environmental activism that's happening in some other communities that are not necessarily present in say my, my birding and canvassing ones because Tucson Audubon has not yet really done enough of that work to have made those connections. But we're like, for, our, for one of our upcoming ones, um, our community organizer, um, Isaiah Portwright, is going to a birding meetup group that is having, uh, I think it's on the 15th, the same day we have our first, our next birding and canvas. Yes. Isaiah is first going to the meetup group and is gonna tell people about our birding and canvassing for the 29th. And that group skews a lot more diverse than uh, a typical Tucson Audubon uh, field trip. Okay. So, yeah, yeah, that was my question because I, I just recently retired. So I'm getting more and more involved now. And I noticed I signed up for the Tucson birding um, meetup. So yeah. I was, that was my question. Do you partner with them? Okay. Well, so they, I have not met the, whoever organizes that. And I've always had a conflict every time I tried, wanted to go. But a couple of people who went on one of theirs were later on a field trip that I led. 
and they told me about it and it just seemed to me like they they get a large turnout and it's age range more diverse yeah. um, and so looking for sometimes again it's making that connection you might have to specifically look for a group that has a different makeup demographically than what you the circles you maybe normally find yourself in and um, you'd be surprised at at connecting over caring about the environment or climate you can connect with tons of people who at first maybe you wouldn't think you can mm -hmm. yeah so tabling also I and mean, it sounds but bringing flyers to places about something you know a lot of people do think do a lot online and that's great and social media is great but also person to person you know being at a park where there are families and there are you know sports teams and this that and the other if you're willing to set up a little table make yourself comfortable get some shade and have your flyers and whatever and then you know as people come by offer them or even walk up to folks and say hey don't want to, you, know, you guys look you're having so much fun don't want to interrupt too much but we're doing something you might care about because it seems like you love the out you know you do a little bit of get over that fear of talking to strangers and hands and then say hey have a great time <laughs> you know enjoy it even if one person out of 20 or 30 you know responds think about the effect it's it really does happen. um Kristen could you just put my um because I can't talk and say my email in the um yeah the chat please feel free to talk to me um if you want you know further ideas if you want to if there's something you want to try and you'd like to talk through logistics or ideas love to um, or if there's a group you'd like to try to connect to us on Audubon too for any of this kind of stuff. You know, we are definitely, partnership is the way to go, definitely. Absolutely, yeah. So I just put your email in the chat. I also, um, just before that, uh, you'll see a link to register for the upcoming birding and canvassing event on the 15th. Um, and I link to protectthevote.net as well. So uh, that you mentioned in, in your presentation. And it's, thank you, Kristen. And if you go to Environmental Voter to get involved, if you're not available on the 15th, but you are on the 29th, that's going to be our last one. We're going to, we don't have a location yet for that one. It'll depend on what neighborhoods need canvassing. The one on the 15th for Arizonans, for Tucsonans is in Fort Lowell Park is where we'll bird. And then we do our canvassing. So. I can put the registration for that one as well. Oh, great, yeah. Yeah. And Environmental Voter Project also has lots of phone banks between now and the election. So that's something you can do from anywhere. Um, and they train, you don't need any prior experience. And then if you, you're more on the if you're more on the partisan side, there are lots of phone banking um, groups are doing phone banking that are partisan focused and a little just a little Googling. The thing I would suggest with that is try out a bunch of different ones. They have different styles. Some are more organized, some less, some have very, you know, some, sometimes a script is one that you just don't feel right about and other ones, some are really fun. And there's one, again, it, it's partisan, so I can't mention it here, but I tried out four different organizations during the 2020 elections that did partisan phone banking. And one of them was a blast. And it was mostly people in their 30s and 40s. And they knew how to have fun while doing this. So trying out a bunch of different ones can really, you know, don't give up if you don't like the first one. So. All right. I've taken too much of your time. It's four afternoon. Well, thank you so much, David. That was so interesting and great to hear and just reaffirms, I think, for me and probably other folks here, um, that commitment to to doing something, you know, to help um, move the needle. So thank you. Um, and thank you for those of you who joined us today, spending the really hour appreciate with it. Um, and like I said, this has been recorded. We'll have it up on our YouTube page. So maybe one of those first actions you can take is to share it with folks who couldn't be here today. Um, <laughs> <Way to go. laughs> and let, let David do the persuading, right? <laughs> you don't have to. Um, so thank you all so much. And uh, feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions.
Thanks. Right, have a good we'll, rest of your uh, day. Maybe we'll see you on the trails in uh, the Tucson area in a couple of months. Oh, oh I, I sure hope, hope so. so. Yeah, reach out to us. We'd be happy to get you set up on a field trip or something like that. So. <laughs> We've joined them in the past, so uh, I'll just have to check the website once we get down there and get organized. I'm going tomorrow to Sabino, back to Sabino. Oh, awesome. yes. Enjoy. That's great. Last week, it, it was so very little birds. It was very disheartening. You know, Sabino is, is Sabino's kind of hit or miss for sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if, you, if you also pay attention to dragonflies, yes, Sabino, I've yes. Increased, they brought it in Sabino Creek. Oh my, just the bridge. Yes. Oh. So, yeah. Very cool. All right. Well, thank you all. Have a good Bye. day. Yeah, thank, thank you, you everybody. Bye -bye. Take care.